I am Lindsay Martin Bilbrey over here at Nifty Method, and we are so excited to be having our webinar today with the one, the only, the awesome Brant Kruger, who very kindly put on a collared shirt just for me. Um, just for you. Just for me. He's been giving us all his DJing skills, which is exactly great. We've got so many people joining us from around the country, around the world today. For those of you that are listening in at home because you're watching this on demand to get that anytime, anywhere credit, know that if you have questions afterwards, we will be completely providing all of this in and sending it your way. Brant's out there active on the Twitter sphere, but don't hit him up on the book of faces. The boy has given up a long time ago, um, but twinked, twinked in. LinkedIn and Twitter, he's still the place to be. Or you can join him on Fridays for the recently revived Event Tech Live, which has been fantastic to kind of go in and in no way, shape, or form stealing from our friend Adam Perry over across the pond there. We're going to jump right in. We've got a couple of housekeeping slides, you know, just that stuff that you can go in um, and get going. So let's see if I remember how to share my screen here in the Zoom world. Oh, yes, just like riding a bike. So many times, so many places. All right, I'm the CEO and that's a really old picture. Pandemic hair, I need to go back and do one of that. This is Brant though. I was joking earlier, we've got a picture of him with hair and there's a really killer one of a baseball cap in a bar there in uh, Vegas. So I promise not to break it out again until that. Here's all those things. This is a live discussion. We have to mute because there's a lot of you and we don't necessarily wanna get that where it's all messy, but the title of this bad boy is Ask Us Anything, Ask Him Anything. So we want your questions. We want the things you're grappling with. We've been hearing from event managers and digital marketers who are now suddenly event managers all around the world going, what the F, my friends, around hybrid? What do we do now that we have to do three events in one? What does it look like from a live stream to change our budgets up? What it's like when we're coming back on site? What does it look like if we are 100% in person and getting challenged with the like safety protocols of a crew that you were already kind of managing before, but still were like, please, someone hold my hand. Submit your questions via the Q&A tab at the bottom of the Zoom window. Someone will get you in the queue. And if we don't get to it, we'll definitely follow up. Technical issues, Courtney and Karen from our team are standing by to help you via questions on quack, chat. I can't use my words today. Submit your questions via chat. Shout us out over on the Twitter. Utilize Zoom support. We'll get you taken care of. Be kind. Spamming and or inappropriate language will not be tolerated. So though we do invite the occasional bomb here or there, we just want it to be in good faith and good favor where we're doing it. And we promise we are recording and we're going to be sending this bad boy out in a week or so so that we can spin it up and make it live. So for those of you who have met Brett before, he is a technical producer and consultant based out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. He's the highly acclaimed, which means he definitely wrote this bio, guys. I'm just kidding. At the Event Leadership Institute, where he has been helping event managers for many, many years, but especially in this last 12 to 18 months, make the pivot into virtual and can to succeed inside a hybrid world. He teaches a certificate course with 20 years of experience inside the industry. He's one of our favorite speakers. In fact, we just spoke with him last week at Smart Meetings. And I think you just made yet another most influential persons list inside the industry. And we'll be joining the actual conference event Tech Live as one of the judges coming up in June. So he brings a wealth of experience. There's not much he hasn't seen. So please ask him, please welcome, please take it away, Mr. Kruger. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Now, to be fair, there were lots of acclamations and many of them were high. So uh, I think uh, I think that's a fair fair assumption. And so uh, you know, you mentioned the 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 pre uh, the pre pandemic hair. So I can vouch. Yep, there I am uh, with hair. And then this was me about June of last year is when, when when that all kind of came to be. So for sure, I think there's been some uh, some shifts. Um, so uh, figured we'd start out. Please, 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 absolutely drop your questions in the chat. I would much rather talk about what you want to talk about than what I'm going to talk about. Um, not to say that you know you won't be fascinated and amazed by what I'm about to talk about, but um, I always, always, always want to talk about what you want to talk about and make it a discussion so that we're getting you uh, the help that you need, getting the explanations that you need, getting you the best practices. Um, but ostensibly, what we kind of wanted to begin with is just to talk about this landscape of where we're at with event technology right now. And what's been fascinating to me is over the course of this last year is we've condensed in about a year 
the entire time that we've had pretty much with event apps. So if you think about event apps going back, you know, six, eight years, you know, it kind of started with onesie twosies. There was only about three or four kind of main companies that were doing an event app where you load it on your phone and you can see your schedule and you can see who the speakers are. And then, you know, they started getting tricky and you could actually add like polling and Q and A built into your event app. And, um, you know, the, you know, over the course of that time though, there really wasn't that much. It was kind of a slow plotting, um, uh, innovation, right? Things were slowly changing, slowly getting better, but the quantity of them was getting more, right? It started out again with four or five event app companies that were providing it. And then we got a little bit more and a little bit more and every year and every time I would think this space is as crowded as it possibly can get with, you know, a couple hundred event apps every year, there'd still be someone would come up with something new and someone would come up with something new, always trying to find that one feature um, that makes them different, that makes them special. Um, but 80% of what they did is kind of the same, right? You know, you load it on your phone, you're walking around the convention center. Okay, there's a map of the convention center. Uh, there's my schedule, there's my agenda. Maybe they've added some networking functionality. Maybe they've added polling and Q&A functionality, all of those kinds of things. Um, so what we can do then is, and then uh, then we started to see the next phase, and the next phase was that we started to see um, consolidation. So um, so as we've got you know more and more and more, literally hundreds of event app companies, slowly people started to buy them up and consolidate. And you know a company like Cvent you know started out as one thing and slowly started acquiring and piecing things together to become kind of the juggernaut that it is now, where literally you can go you know soup to nuts register registration, event management, event app, all the way through, you know, marketing and everything in between to the end of your event. Um, and so that all took place over about, again, six to eight years, you know, to the point where at the beginning of all that, like, oh, when are event apps going to take off? We just don't have enough internet, you know, around to be able to, uh, to be able to actually you know, use these apps. Like that was literally a concern early on is like, well, what if we can't get internet in our, in our venues? What we've done though, over the last year with our online event platforms is all of that six to eight years in like one year, we went from four or five kind of incumbent platforms, your Entrados, your, your on 24s, your meeting plays, um, those types of folks to hundreds, <laughs> literally, literally over the course of the year as basically every event app, every piece of event technology, every audiovisual vendor, every production company, every um, uh, logistics house, uh, even some of the hotel brands, every single one of them came out with their own version of an online event platform. And it was the same kind of thing. It started out with four, started, you know, slowly added on. And each one of them was adding like their one twist on what they thought was, you know, the, the thing that needed to be a part of our online events. And so what you've got though, then is again, this feature set where 80% of it is the same, right? We've got the, the Brady Bunch boxes. We've got the ability to do chat and polling and Q and A kind of table stakes type stuff. Maybe you've got the ability to see your agenda and set personalized agendas. Um, maybe the ability to add sponsorship banners, maybe the ability to add an expo aspect where you can go and visit, um, uh, you know, visit virtual, virtual vendors and suppliers and sponsors and those kinds of things. And we've already started to reach the consolidation phase where we're starting to see companies buy up. Uh, other companies and and glom this on and add this piece in and you know see event continues to expand and grow um and so what's absolutely amazing to me is you know any i don't want to in any way uh you know downplay the seriousness of the tragedy of this last year but out of tragedy frequently comes these bursts of innovation the the online event space had been plodding along for 10 years with almost no very incremental uh increases in uh in again the technology and making it better and reducing lag and adding functionality and then kaboom just over the course of this last year so 
what I keep kind of using as an analogy is we've gotten in one year where we probably would have eventually gotten to by like 2030 had we just kept plodding along. So we've really, really pushed the industry um, in, in, in ways that it was uncomfortable to do. We didn't want to do it. It took a tragedy of this magnitude to force us to move the ball and to advance. But now the question is, what can we do about it? You know, what can we, by, by the way, I'm watching the chat and it's always, the chat's always amusing. It's like, can, can we just see Brant? And then we start to see people come in and say, hey, we can only see Brant. <laughs> so, so please, please, please do be sure to, to drop your questions in there. I did see a few come in. I just thought that was kind of amusing because that's always a thing. Um, so let's let's get into that. And so let's start to talk about now where we're at now, um, get your questions answered. Um, I just think that it's important to realize how far we've come in the in this year and how no matter how much people desperately want to quote unquote go back to normal the universe has changed it's changed in our daily lives it's changed in our event lives um, so moving forward it's just it's just a different ball game it's just going to be uh so let's take a look and see what we've got to start coming in um we host our annual gala this is from maria for 500 people each year annual gala in november last year we were 100 percent virtual do you think this year we have to offer a hybrid option or do you feel you could go back to 100 percent in person so maria one of the things that i emphasize all the time is knowing your stakeholders. Have you asked them <laughs> what, you, what they want to do? So talk to them about it, but don't just say, do you want to go back to in-person? You need to dig in and find out why. And I'll tell you a great example of, of, one, of the, one of the organizations that I'm working with that kind of blew my mind a little bit is they, they were it was an in-person group that I was working with. They went online uh, last year. I didn't have anything to do with that, um, with their online event. Um, it didn't go well, um, and uh, everyone desperately wanted to return to in-person. But they didn't just take the, well, that didn't work, let's go back to in-person. They actually talked with their attendees to try and find out why they want to come back to in-person. What did they like? What didn't like? And what was fascinating is when they broke through the, well, I just want to be in-person. I think it's just better in-person. Once they broke through that, what they discovered was, and this is for, is for an industry association, what they discovered was is that people liked the FOMO that was created for the people who couldn't come. And so by taking it online, it democratized it. And they, they, that they actually enjoyed, it was a status thing, right? So that I could go to the national meeting, but that person couldn't go. And so really breaking down and understanding the why actually has now changed how they're looking at their in-person meetings. Because now, instead of it just being an education conference, they're really looking at it more like an incentive trip more like a how do we make our experience more exclusive. So it's not really what we're talking about there, but it's a great example of really drilling in to find out what your attendees want and what your attendees like. Because when you have that hybrid element, it opens up possibilities, it opens up your audience. And so most of the time as organizers, that's what we want, right? We want a bigger audience, we want a bigger uh, and more diverse grouping. So as we start to reincorporate our in-person audiences, and that's important that I'm using that phrase, we're reincorporating, we're not going back to in-person, we're starting to reincorporate. Because for a long period of time here, our, we're gonna have a long tail on this thing. And I know I'm spending a lot of time on this question, but it, it covers a lot of bases. Um, we're gonna have a long tail on this thing. As we can already see, guidances change on a dime. Um, we have we have countries and states that are having lower cases. We have countries and states that are starting to have tragically high cases. So this thing globally is going to have a long tail. And so for a lot of events, um, you're actually still going to have a larger audience in your online audience than you will in your in-person audience. So as we start to reincorporate the in-person audience, just you got to keep that in mind that, you know, you got to work with your presenters to say, I know we have people in the room, but the majority of the people that are attending are out there. So you can't be pacing the stage quite so much. You can't be just exclusively talking to the people in the room. Bring those cameras up closer so that they can really feel that as we move into hybrid. Say, there's your primary audience. Talk to these people as well, but let's keep that in mind. So a lot of things wrapped up in that question of, um, should we, how do we feel about going back to 100% in person? It's not about what we feel 
as organizers. It's about what our attendees feel, where we're located in the country and in the world, and what's going on around that that's going to really determine um, whether or not you just say, heck with the online audience um, and just go to fully in person. But just bear in mind, you might have added a lot of people to I'm falling way behind in your chat, but this is one more point, important point, and, I, and, I'll, and then I'll move on. Um, by opening up your event, you've potentially opened up your event to people who can't come in person. So people with mobility issues, people with travel issues, people who can't afford it, um, people who are really high up in their organizations to the point where they can't take three days out of the office. So just bear in mind, if you decide, you know, we're just going to go back to what we were doing before, you have the potential of excluding people that you've already added to your audience. So I just wanted to make sure we made that point. All right, scrolling down to see what I missed. Uh, two in-person events, uh, hoping to go to in-person meeting in August. Uh, my first, uh, hey, hey, Ksenia, nice to see you. Um, my first, uh, it hasn't quite contracted yet, so knock on wood, uh, my first in-person will be in August as well. So uh, please share research for in-person conference value propositions not generated by hoteliers, DMCs, or cities. I'm struggling with naysayers. Research for in-person conference value propositions. Um, Michelle, I might need some clarification on that. Are you saying research that proves it's good to be back in person uh, or more than that? Yeah, thanks for thanks, Nifty, for uh, keeping keeping me on on the rails. Uh, have you seen or produced any short videos to help clients understand, uh, demonstrate the fact that hybrid events are truly two events? Um, I'll take uh, a little bit of umbrage with that uh, there, uh, Lindsay and crew. Um, unless you were just repeating somebody else's that I'd missed. Uh, the, I don't see it as two events. So, so in truly in hybrid, so those of you that have seen me talk anytime in the last couple of weeks, um, uh, have seen me do this little song and dance before, um, is that I tend to see these things, thanks, <laughs> it's repeating the question, good, because otherwise I'd probably miss it, is I tend to see these things as um, like a spectrum. So rather than hard and fast. So if we've got our online events here, and you can kind of think of it about, you know, types of audiences, or uh, the amount of interaction that you've got within your audiences. So you've got fully online events over here. And on this side, you've got fully, I'm sorry, so this is, uh, this is fully in person events, and this is fully online events. Um, if you kind of keep moving this way, the next thing is broadcast, right? You stick a camera in the room and you're broadcasting your in person experience to a separate audience. If I'm watching the Super Bowl or I'm watching the World Cup, I don't feel like I'm part of the Super Bowl or part of the World Cup. I'm watching it. Now, there may be some opportunities for interaction in here. You know, I, I look back at things like, uh, you know, even Ellen DeGeneres taking a selfie at the Oscars, right, and putting it on social media. As social media has, has, has come, become involved, we're starting to get some interaction between remote audiences and in-person audiences in the broadcast realm. But it's not really truly hybrid. Um, for the most part, like I said, you don't feel like you're part of the Super Bowl. You don't feel like you're part of the World Cup. Then as you start to keep moving along, that's when you hit hybrid. And that, for me, is kind of the sweet spot of you've got interaction and connection between your two audiences, between your in-person audience and your remote audience, to the point where they feel like they're part of the same event. They might not be the, you know, it might not be the same experience, right? They're not gonna have exactly the same agenda because the remote audience can't have muffins and, co muffins and coffee and can't come to the, you know, the after party, but you're gonna wanna try and generate an equivalent experience at that event and they feel like they're part of the same event. For me, that's where the magic of hybrid is, is being able to make all of your locations because it doesn't just have to be one location. You can have multiple in-person locations as well as remote audiences, all feeling like they're part of the same event and all feeling like they're equally connected to that event. And then three quarters of the way here, and this is a recent addition to me, is digital first, where our primary audience is the online audience, the digital audience. And then secondarily, we have in-person audiences watching that, like coming together to watch a live stream, coming together to watch that live feed, and then all the way over to online events. I find that if you think of it kind of on that scale, 
uh, you know, as like a spectrum. You don't get so locked into what is a hybrid, what isn't a hybrid. Um, and, you know, I, you know, to try and answer, I don't have any like stats I can tell you that, 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 that say we should get together in person. Um, that, again, goes back to this idea of knowing your audience, knowing your stakeholders. For a lot of stakeholders, there's value in that in-person experience, but you need to dig in and find out what that value is. Sometimes that value can be found in other ways via online. Some of it can't, you know, it's the, it's the, the networking in the bar afterward um, of the event. Um, or like in the, you know, the old movie, The Color of Money, you know, the real money is in the green room. It's not on the floor. It's not in the contest. So you have to really truly find out what that value is for your stakeholders. So I wouldn't, even if there were like generic stats on the value of in-person events, which I think most of us in the industry have an instinctive affinity for, um, I wouldn't necessarily base your event on those stats, if that makes sense. I would want to do my own independent research about what my attendees want and what value they get out of attending. So uh, Michelle was just saying they were looking for meetings, uh, mean business type stats uh, to show the value of in-person meetings. I think whatever stats we had before still exists. So, um, uh, you know, that, that, that meetings mean business is actually a great resource for those kinds of things. Um, but I guess, I guess what I'd kind of keep picking at is why are you trying to prove it? Um, you know, just, just, just keep an open mind, you know, there might not, not every event needs to be in person. If we've learned anything over the course of the last year, it's that not every single meeting, not every single event needs to be in person and be aware of that. Be aware of that, that your attendees have that mentality. Now we've been used to this for a year. Now, a lot of us are sick of this <laughs> and we're ready to, to get, believe me, I am not a hugger, but I have saved up an awful lot of hugs. So the first industry event that I go to, um, be warned, there may be a hug involved. So, um, so just bear that in mind that it's important to know your stakeholders, know what value means to them and know that they're starting to make the calculations of, is this something I need to go to in person? And especially if there are competitors in your space and you don't offer an online option that you do go like we were talking about before to a fully in-person event because you've just decided that that's the way you should go and they do offer an online version they that starts to factor into the calculations right so you know a lot of people have learned i don't need to go to orlando in august for four days and i'm not picking on orlando um, but it gets me out of the office for four days and it's exhausting because we have to pack everything into a single, you know, thing because we're out of the office for four days. So those organizations that have started to think about what can we do to loosen up, maybe have smaller, you know, online meetings more often and then still have a big annual event. Um, you know, start to play with that. We're no longer bound by time and space <laughs> when it comes to online events. So you don't have to pack things in as tightly. Um, and you can start to experiment with doing like three Mondays in a row from 3 p.m. to 5, as opposed to, you know, packing everything into a single day. So be sure and, you know, if I, I know I keep going back to it because it's so important. And I think in the rush to like, yay, we can go back. People aren't having these conversations with their stakeholders, aren't having these conversations with their attendees to see what they want. Um, and so just to put the cap on that and then we'll move on, um, I'm kind of, it's, it's not a right metaphor, but it's kind of like the Netflixification of events, right? So just like we as a family have to decide and have been doing this for years, by the way, you know, do you pack up the whole family, put them in the car, drive to the movie theater, get the popcorn, get the big gulp to watch that movie? Or is that something we just wait and watch it when it comes out on Netflix or Disney Plus or something along those lines. People are going to be making those internal decisions now on your events as well. So you need to start keeping that in mind that they they may decide that your in-person experience just isn't worth it to them when they can get 80% of what they want online. All right, next question. 
Uh, love the idea of all the benefits of hybrid, but how do I afford it? I can't triple my AV tech budget. There's, uh, you know, it's unfortunate. There's, there's a bit of a scare myth going around right now that, oh, it's going to double my AV budget. It's going to triple my AV budget, but back it off and just think about, it. so some events it might, especially really small events, because you're adding things that you didn't normally have, but a lot, most even, you know, medium, medium, small to medium and definitely large events already have microphones, already have cameras, already have lights. That's 80% of what you need, right? So now what you're adding on is you're adding on the internet access, the streaming. Um, most of the equipment that you need for that is already in the room. Um, you're going to need some kind of uh, stream box encro encoder that's going to let you take those audio visual signals and get it out. And then you're going to need a platform. Most of the event apps that were around pre-2020 added on online event platform capabilities over the top. So if you were going to have an event app at your event and you already have audio visual in the room, and even most events, these, you know, by the by the time we were at, you know, the end of 2019, usually for some reason or another had a hardline internet connection backstage because we were doing polling or QA or something along those lines. A lot of that is still in place as you as you start to reincorporate that in-person audience. So it doesn't have to be triple what you were gonna pay, half, you know, double what you were gonna pay. You know, there's, you know, the even the online platforms, the online platforms that are out there go from literally free to three hundred thousand dollars. So depending on your budget, you can find something in between there. So I, I, is it going to cost more? Sure. But the analogy that I've been using lately is if you have an event that's only in one place, that's relatively simple to plan. You only have to pay for that space. Um, you can get the audience in and get the audience out. Um, as soon as you add something like an offsite, you know, a dinner or something along those lines, it starts to get a little bit more, even if you add another room in the venue, it starts to get more complicated, right? You need staffing to be able to go and monitor that room, make sure it's all set up in advance. What you're adding, and this goes back to the metaphor we've been using for the last year, is you're adding another venue, right? When you add this online platform, it's another venue for your attendees. So you've added another venue. So yes, you're going to need someone to go off site and make sure it's all set up in advance and ready for them to go and, you know, be there for when the buses get in and all of that kind of stuff. So it's not any more complicated um, than adding more venues to your event, adding off sites, adding dinners, all those kinds of things. Um, and then the costs are the cost of adding a venue. Um, so it helps, I think, sometimes to look at it in those ways. So hopefully that helps dispel the fears a little bit of, um, uh, of, of hybrid land. I mean, the biggest thing to keep in mind is just don't panic. All right. Just most of the stuff that you need to know, you already know. Um, and much like we were a year ago, people are panicking, trying to get ready to get online. Most of the time it just needed to take a breath and go back to the knowledge that you already had about designing experiences, because that's what we're doing. Now you're just designing experiences for both an in-person audience and a remote audience. And you've been doing remote audiences for a year. So that's why I think it's helpful to say that we're reincorporating the in-person audience. We don't have to throw away everything we've learned over the course of the last year as we reincorporate. All right, I'm falling behind again. Uh, Lindsay is always is, is trying to keep me on the rails as I, as I tend to wax poetic about these things. All right, so we addressed the hybrid costs. Yep, seeing uh, Gary saying we're seeing more and more in re in in real life events coming back uh, quickly in Vegas. Yep, yep. Uh, question from Eric: uh, We use Mailchimp for email blasts. Mailchimp uses third party listmanage.com uh, to track opens and clicks. Some large company networks blacklist messages routed through listmanage.com. We've now disabled tracking opens and clicks when we send a blast message. Is there a better system to use for blast emails to avoid uh, this problem? Um, not really. I mean, the problem is that anything that you use that involves tracking or, or opens or something along those lines is a potential vector because it's two-way communication from opening an email. And so large companies have a tendency to not like the idea of there's suddenly two-way communication just because someone opened an email. 
Um, and as a result, that's why they've locked on, they've locked in and locked down. It's going to very much depend on, again, knowing your stakeholders. So if large amounts of your stakeholders are in these organizations, you need to try and find something that isn't blocked with them. Or you're going to have to go to those individual organizations and say, what do we need to do to get our emails through your filters? What can we do to, to green light them? Um, and uh, I'll be honest with you, if it really gets bad, there are um, plugins for Gmail uh, that will, you can only do in small batches, but it'll automate it so that it'll do, here's 40 today, 40 tomorrow, 40 the next day. I don't know what the cutoff is. It's more than 40, but I want to say it's 200. You're only allowed to send 200 messages a day from Gmail. Um, but then those tend to get through because they don't look like automated messages. So there's options, but the biggest thing that you should do is try and figure out how large of a part of your audience is that and what can we do to get around it, um, effect, like, like legitimately get around it, not get around it, like get around their policy. Uh, what do we think about audio only types of events like Clubhouse? I have um, I have uh, been opinionated on, on this on this on this uh, 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 point. Um, I'm on record as saying, and I will, you know, let me know. Uh, I'm on record as saying pretty early on. You know, talk to me in a year after Clubhouse was the hot snot, um, and uh, because it just feels to me like Periscope, Meerkat, and a thousand other flavors of the day. Um, and I think it's not a coincidence that as soon as they started to see their numbers decline is when they released on Android. Um, I'm never a fan of any app, to be perfectly honest, that is iOS only, Android only. I have a foot in every one of these playgrounds because I love technology. And there's things that my Macs are better for. There's things that my Windows machines are better for, um, you know, have iPhones, but then, you know, I keep a couple Android devices around. So I'm, I'm never a fan of things that are not cross-platform. So I am excited to see uh, Twitter spaces. I think, I think um, you know, in general, it's a category that was easily replicable. So that's why Facebook jumped on it, Twitter jumped on it, you know, and that's another thing that I think is going to prove to be a downside for Clubhouse. So, uh, so thanks, uh, Nikos, uh, for that. Um, but in general, it's, it's fine. I like, I like podcasts, right? And so these things are basically live versions of podcasts. Um, it's pretty easy to be down the chain far enough that you're, it's not like you're being actively involved. And so even early on in Clubhouse, you started seeing people tuning in, but never being promoted and never being able to be a part of the conversation. So at what point then does it become a podcast if I can't be part of the conversation? So that's, that's kind of my hot take on it is, uh, is, and the other thing that, that is, is that invite only thing. It's like, oh, it's invite only and it's only on iOS. So it feels very exclusionary. And I'm a, as a general rule, try to make, I'm a big fan of trying to make our events more open and more, um, uh, well, more open. And so that's why I'm a huge fan of hybrid and online events and have been for 10 years, um, because it's a way to expand your audience and make it more open and make it more accessible um, uh, to folks. How do I add engagement to my hybrid events? Uh, a lot of our engagement and networking are offsite or uh, dinner and coffee type networking traditional. So that's where you have to start breaking the mold of trying to do the same things because these, these, yeah, a Zoom cocktail hour is okay, but the big difference between a digital cocktail hour and an in-person cocktail hour is that in our in-person events, um, you can get away, right? You, you, you can go into a corner, you can duck out into the hallway, you can step outside onto the, you know, onto the patio. So it's easier to have smaller conversations. And when you watch a large event, other than like the dance floor, um, that's what you wind up with is groups of 10 or less uh, talking to people. So you can't just throw it online and say, we're going to have a digital networking party and then have 50 people in the same room. It doesn't work. So if you're going to try and do that, the trick is you need to try and get those groups smaller and you can then rotate them faster. Um, I mean, really, if you've only got 
five, 10 minutes, you can't have more than five people in that room because by the time you say, hi, I'm Brant, I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and, I've, and I like cats. You know, by the time everybody goes around, you've, you know, you've already spent half your time. Um, and then to try and actually talk about something and network, you, you don't have any time left. So the, the, when, especially when it comes to networking, um, you have to try and find ways to find equivalent value again, right? So it can't be the same event. You're looking for equivalent value. So be able to do smart networking, right? You know, look for ways to get people of like minds that attended the same sessions, um, have the same questions to connect. That's where some of the AI stuff that's being developed can be interesting. Um, although a lot of the stuff that I've tried, it was kind of amusing because the only people I wound up getting connected to were like the head of marketing for that company, the company that was doing the AI. It's like, great, that's who I wanted to talk to. So. So the, then, then the, the broader question of engagement is about design. You have to design it in, right? You can't just have, say, well, we've got polling and Q&A in the app, so there's our engagement. You have to then design, you have to bake in engagement, bake in interactivity into the design of your event um, and, and, and not fall into the trap of throwing a technological solution at it. So even if you throw AI networking and whatever the latest, you know, hot snot polling app is um, at your event, that does not equal engagement. You have to design it in. You have to work with your presenters to say, all right, we're going to do a poll. And then if you're working online, you need to work with your presenters to talk about how that's going to work. Because a lot of these platforms are running on a minimum of a 30 second delay from the time that I say something to the time that you hear it. Zoom, if you're just in Zoom, is one of the fastest, lowest latency platforms that's out there. But as soon as you start to layer on some of these other platforms, so you use Zoom as the back end so we can talk to each other quickly, but as soon as you layer that on to, to distribute it wider and add banners and, and all of that kind of stuff, um, you start to see easily 20 second delays, 30 second delays. If you fire up YouTube Live, it's almost a solid minute before it actually goes live and start spooling it out uh, to, to your viewers. So as soon as you hit go on the live stream, that does not mean that that's when your attendees see it. So it's always a good idea if, if you're using platforms like YouTube, Vimeo, Facebook, these large platforms, LinkedIn Live, start early, right? So have, have a little pre-show like we were doing, some music, some things like that, because if you hit go right at the top of the hour, people aren't getting in until a minute later. So engagement has to be baked in from the beginning of your event. Um, and I'm oh, sorry, where I was going with that is you, you have to work with your presenters, let them know about this delay. So if I do a poll, so if I say, hey, everybody, um, I don't want to wreck the chat because I've got questions in there, but I'll just use, use this as an example. So if I said, hey, everybody, real quick, use a, a one or a zero uh, in the chat, a one if it's a beautiful day where you're at and a zero if it's a terrible day, don't do it because I want to keep the questions. <laughs> If you do that, it's going to be potentially 30 seconds before you hear it, think about whether or not it's a good day, then enter your information into the chat. And so by the time I'm looking for results, it could be almost a full minute later. So anytime you're doing polls or Q&A or chat questions or things like that, make sure your presenters understand that you have to ask the question and then vamp for a minute before you go start looking for the results. Um, all right, Lindsay's told, telling me if I want to do a quick poll or something like that for interactivity, we can. So let's do that. All right, so real quick. So, all right, either a zero or a one. A one means it's a beautiful day where I'm at. A zero means it's 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 not so great. I don't want to get into point ones or anything like that. So we'll just do a ones or zeros. All right, so it's beautiful, 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 not so beautiful. So it's mostly beautiful day around our audience today. And um, uh, you know, another way that you can start to bake in engagement is doing exactly something like this, right? That's platform agnostic. As long as there a chat is a chat, you can do something like that. And because we're all on Zoom webinar, I started seeing stuff almost right away. I didn't have to worry so much about having a delay. Um, so, especially for things like interactivity, um, it's it's great to do that. Another thing that I'll recommend is having a host, right? Having have you know having Lindsay on the back end is helping me enormously, being able to filter through the questions. So if I miss something, it's 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 in there. So that's keeping me honest. It's keeping me answering your questions as we move along in here. 
Um, and, uh, and having a, a host or moderator that's a pro that knows what they're doing. Um, I had an opportunity to take, uh, an online, uh, a moderating course, um, from a couple of the, the guys that have a company, uh, in Europe called Masters in Moderation. So Jan Yap and Hans and those guys, uh, they do a great job. And I learned about just those little things of, you know, anytime you feel the energy dipping or something like that, just doing a quick poll like that, just something that gets people engaged, that gets people involved. And it, you know, it's, it's, it's stuff you have to bake in that you just can't throw technology. And it's, it's little stuff like, Hey, Ethan, Hey, Susan, Hey, Dixie, Hey, Anna, Hey, Jeanette. You know, you, when you hear your names, your brain goes into a different mode and you're less likely to drift off into checking the email. Um, that's why as often as possible, I actually just use straight up zoom meetings because you can have people turn their cameras on and you can actually see, when people start to drift off and you know, just kind of click, especially on iPads, right? Because you see this <laughs> as people are doing it. So bake in that interactivity from, you know, it's got to be designed in. It's not something you can just throw in uh, by, by, by paying for technology. How do you find third-party audiovisual teams now? My normal team went under, oh, I'm sorry, and have completely gotten out of the business. That has been um, uh, one of the sad and frustrating things over the course of this last year, um, is in addition to all of the folks in general that, that, that lost their jobs um, by being furloughed or laid off or companies closing, it felt like there was a lot of production folks that could have survived um, there were, there were a lot of AV and event companies that didn't just furlough everybody and hope to weather the storm. They were proactive. They, they, they started getting their people, getting their, you know, clients on the phone saying, how can we help you take your event online? What can we do to help you? And those companies not only survived, they thrived. Those companies were, are, were hiring over the course of this last year. But so many production partners, again, furloughed everybody, sat on their hands, you know, hope to get a PPP loan and survive. But then by the time it got to be three months in, four months in, five months in, it was too late to bring everybody back and call of all of their clients and say, what can we do to help? And that's why so many, it's like triple tragic because people losing their jobs, companies going under, but then also the planners got handed this, I can't say the word, because um, uh, it's, it's a clean woman, all right? Keep it clean. Um, uh, just got handed this and said, here, go make online events, you know, and with, with nothing, no training, no help, nothing. And it's, you know, that's what caused a lot of pain uh, over the course of the last year uh, was, uh, was, was just the, the lack of production partners. So now to come around, and answer your question is the unfortunate reality is we lost a lot of people, not only literally, but also to, to other industries. Um, so we lost a lot of good people to the pandemic, but then we also lost a lot of good people to the pandemic. Um, and it's, uh, we're going to see a brain drain uh, in this industry, not only in, in senior planners and mid-level planners and young planners um, who just had to go find another job and just won't come back. And so I think it's something that you need to know as you're starting to work with audiovisual teams is that they're all struggling to hire now too, to, to re-get back good stuff. So try and find the folks that survived. Try and find the folks that, you know, were six months in and hiring um, as best you can, as opposed to the ones that are just coming back now. Because much like we were talking about with online events, those ones who transitioned right away to online events, they've been innovating for the last year. And now as they reincorporate their in-person audiences, um, they're going to, they're actually going to have the capital to have, you know, buy some new gear, get some new lights, get some new equipment. So how do you find them? It's kind of the same way we found them before is you got to talk to your colleagues, talk to other people in the industry. So when I'm trying to find new AV in a city I haven't been to before. I try and find people that I know that live around there and say, hey, you know, um, Lindsay, do you know anybody? Um, and, uh, you know, add those folks to your list because we don't find plumbers in the yellow pages anymore, right? We find them by searching social media and by asking our friends, who did you use when they had it on? So, you know, you, you don't just go find an AV company by Googling AV companies. You know, you can do that as, as, a, as a signal 
um, just to see what their online presence is. But you know, you got to ask around and and look and do your due diligence and ask for references. And um, you know, one of the one of the big uh, tips that uh, we had over this course of this last year is you know asking for references for online platforms. Is can you can you give me one that's newer than you know a year ago? Uh, let's see here. And I know, I, th I think we were only supposed to go 45 minutes, but I'm happy to hang around as long until Lindsay kicks me off. <laughs> so, so we're, we're able to, uh, to, to do that. Um, let's see, site visit checklist. Um, ask about staffing. So you're prepared. Yep. Yep. So, uh, yeah, I think it's good. And, and I'll give you an example is, you know, we were, well, while we were still under the impression that we might be doing in-person events in November last year. Um, I was still dealing with the head of AV for one of the big hotels in, in Vegas. And he's like, yeah, if I don't answer my phone, I'll be, it's because I'm cleaning the pool. Um, so a lot of people that, that held onto their jobs did so because they were doing multiple jobs. Um, and it's going to be a while before that all gets sorted out. So, Okay, we've got a full hour. Thanks. I wasn't sure if we were doing forty-five plus Q and A, but since we've been doing Q and A the whole time, uh, I'm yeah, we'll, we'll be we'll be fine. So let's see here. From Suzanne, what pitfalls? And it's probably a good reminder. Hey, we've got fifteen minutes left, so get those questions in, and I'm more than happy to uh, help you along with your. I, I'm surprised there haven't been more hybrid questions as people are kind of being forced to. Uh, hopefully, that's a good sign. Um, that we're, we're using what we've learned over the course of the last year. My, my concern is that it might be a bad sign because we're just going to, yeah, we're just going to go back to what we were doing before. Stick a camera in the back and call it hybrid. It's good. Uh, from Suzanne, what pitfalls should we avoid when deciding who to work with on your event technology? Everyone has had to become an event tech uh, of sort. Yep, we were just talking about that. That doesn't mean we know what we're doing. Yep. Um, what is the, here you go. Enjoy. Um, what's the best uh, way to have your event tech give you the best ideas, but not gauge, uh, not gouge you because you're clueless? Tell us the secrets. Um, well, the secret first <laughs> secret number one. Uh, secret number one is that I don't generally like to have tech drive. Um, we want to be in the driver's seat and then decide what our technology is. So this was this was a problem long before this last year of people just wanting to throw the latest shiny at their event in hopes that it will make their event better. Um, throwing technology at your event does not make your event better. Uh, but you can use technology to make your event better. But the thing is, you know, it goes back to what we started with and what I will infinitely repeat, knowing your stakeholders, you know, so not just your, your attendees, but your internal stakeholders, your sponsors and your exhibitors what they want to get out of their event. So you want to use technology to make their experiences better. All of those stakeholders. So you want to use technology to make uh, your lives better because it's helping you manage the event. It's helping you keep organized. It's helping you keep on top of things, all of that kind of stuff. You want to use technology to make the attendees' lives better, you know, make it easy to connect. I think all of us over this course of this last year have seen, have attended online events where like, oh, that was easy. That was, that was great. And then others where it's like, oh, where do I click? What do I do? How, how does this, you know? And so you can feel that intrinsic pull, push and pull between throwing technology at something because it's technology versus putting technology, using technology to make our lives better. Using technology for our for our sponsors, right? So being able to use our digital tools to give them new opportunities and new ways to make the most out of not just handing them a list at the end and saying, here's the attendees, but saying, here's the attendees that attended these five breakout sessions that are on a subject that your company does. Like there's real value in that. And so finding, finding the technology that's going to make your events better is about first deciding how we can make our event better and then finding technology to do that. Um, I've been saying for a decade now, even as, as techy as a guy as I am, and I love playing with all my little toys here, I would rather see old technology used well than new technology used just because it's new. Um, and I think that's something that we need to keep in mind, that we don't always just go for the, the new hotness. 
Um, you know, uh, oh, I, I've heard I've, I've heard the word hop in uh, multiple times in my newsfeed over the course of the last month. I must use hop in. You know, there's nothing against hop in. Um, they've just been in the news a lot lately. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, you probably have a fine experience, but just using it because it's new or hot or because you saw it, you know, in the latest uh, BizBash uh, edition doesn't mean that it's right for your group, doesn't mean that it's right for your audience. All right. So and so honestly, when you're a small association with a limited budget, uh, like Donna talks about, um, and what what uh, you know Suzanne was probably implying, is is you know really continue to and, and so so that's how you avoid falling into that trap. It's like just throwing money at something. Is implementing things smartly. Um, you know, you can have a great event in a field, or you can have a great event in the ballroom of the Ritz Carlton. Those are very different experiences and how you design them is going to make a difference. Um, so let's see here. A couple things coming in from Donna. Hybrid's a lot of work. It doesn't seem fair to the people that actually came to the event. Um, we're considering doing in-person only events one month. Okay, now I'm gonna challenge you a little bit on this, Donna. Are you not wanting to do it because it's a lot of work for you? Or are you not wanting to do it because your attendees don't want it? Um, just, just, you know, I don't need an answer. I don't need an answer. I just, I think it's really important as we, as we look at this, that you've made by going online, you've made it convenient for some people. So are you then going to say, thank you, goodbye. You have to come in person. Um, that might be right for your group. As I talked about earlier, the example that I gave earlier, that might be right for your group but it's not right for every group. So this doesn't seem fair is interesting to me. That's an interesting aspect of it because fair is a very loaded word. And so if you remember what we were talking about when I was doing my little doodles before, when we talked about the, the spectrum and having hybrid in the middle, we talked about making those equivalent experiences, right? And, and making it so that you feel part of the same event. That doesn't mean that in-person isn't different than hybrid, um, if I'm making sense on that. So I just think be careful of the fairness thing. And if you're worried about, and I'll just, because this might, I'm, this might be digging down to what the core of the question is, and if it's not, I apologize. Um, uh, what what's, re, what's usually behind these types of questions and comments is stuff that we've been talking about for 10 years when it comes to hybrid events is that people are worried that the hybrid experience, the online experience is going to cannibalize the in-person experience. Um, and the, the evidence is not that, um, you know, research going back 10 years has shown, and I want to say it's something like 86% of events the year after implementing a hybrid uh, component either didn't see any increase or decrease in their uh, in-person event size or saw an increase in their in-person event size. So the evidence behind it does not show any um, cannibalization of the in-person event. And so really good hybrid events can act as marketing for your in-person events. Um, so a small association with a limited budget, I, I understand. I understand that that can be tough, um, but for the relatively, again, if you've already got cameras and stuff like that in the room, um, it doesn't have to be that much more expensive. And it doesn't have to be a $300,000 event platform. It can be less, it can be significantly less. So that's, so that's, yeah. So that's, that's, that's what I would take on that is that, that it's, there's a lot of loaded words in that question, Donna. So, but I appreciate the question. Um, but it, it makes me really want to dig in more to your particular attendees. Uh, from Eric, and I see Ellen in here, and then we'll come back around to a couple of those other ones. So let's see, Eric, uh, at one of our purely virtual events where we're offering continuing education credits, the credentialing organization requires signatures from the attendees when they join and leave each session in order to receive credit for the session. We'd like to know if there's an efficient and economical way to implement this requirement. Um, yeah, I can think of a couple different ways. Um, if it has to be time stamped, that's one thing. Um, you know, so if it's time stamped, I sign in, literally sign in and sign out. Um, a lot of the platforms are capable of tracking to see when someone 
connects and when someone leaves. So not only that they attended the session, but that their monitor was on the whole time. Um, any kind of collected signature isn't going to get you any more than that. So that, I mean, that would be roughly the same thing. So you can say, we can verify that this is that person, here's their signature, which could literally be a DocuSign or something along those lines. Um, uh, and that for most organizations has been enough to be able to say they attended and that they were there the whole time. Um, if they literally need signatures, um, I know there was, I, I'm, I, I wouldn't be able to pull it to you off the top of my head, but feel free to send me an email or something, Eric. It's brant at brantkruger.com. It's really hard. Um, uh, I could probably dig it up. That One of the online platforms that I heard about early on last year had a way of doing signing for um, things like uh, NDAs and confidentiality and things like that. They had a digital signing that was legal um, as they were going into it. That's probably Lindsay starting to say, we got to hurry it up because we're getting ready no, to cut. I was actually going to say, we were billed for an hour and a half, so we can kind of go in. We've got probably six or seven more clients for okay. questions, kind of hiding in the weeds. But um, Hopin does that, and so does Sketch. It was more to come in with a couple of names, and we okay. can pull together some resources there. Yeah, and then down and dirty, because I think there's relatively free plans. I think you could use like a DocuSign or something like that. So you would sign it, you know, initially uh, when you log in, and then there's probably a way to, and that's timestamped, and then there's probably a way to do it another way. But uh, I think you'd probably be better off having it part of your platform. Um, one of the things I alluded to really early on, and I'll just quick recap and then hit some of these other questions, is is that 80% of the functionality is the same, but then, then, like I said, each one of these platforms has their one thing. That was the one thing on a couple of platforms, as we talked about. So, so finding, you know, finding those things that make your event different then helps you lock in on which platform is going to be yours, uh, going to make the most sense for you. But that 80% will get you most of the way there. And it's just a matter of figuring out some of these noodles. So you're probably going to be okay with almost any platform, but finding the 20% that matches is what's going to be huge. So we wanted to do for the last seven questions, kind of a lightning round and also invite kind of those, because I know some people are having to leave at the hour mark, but just also to bring in a little objectivity and um, participation, participation. So if you're cool with me joining you for just a little bit, Brant. Bring it. All right. So the way this is going to work is for everyone at home or joining us wherever you are on the road, hopefully from a luxurious travel destination, right? Fingers crossed we're getting back to it. Um, we want to hear from you what you think these answers are as well, because there's been some really good conversations happening in the chat as attendees have been bringing up ideas and challenges and things. So just like we would if we were at MPIWC or PCMA or gathered together at a chapter happy hour, we want to have the conversations happening as well as Brant's expertise. So your voice is just as important as his voice because we're all in this together. So lightning round. What is the biggest risk of using technology at our events? <laughs> that it will fail. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's always a balance, right, of, of the benefit to your event versus the possibility that it could fail. And anytime there's internet involved, um, there's a chance that it's going to fail. And that's been the hardest thing for people to let go over the course of this last year is that planners, literally plan is in the name. So it's very difficult for planners to let go that they're not going to have the power over every single aspect of their event from start to finish, which they're used to doing in person is having power from the moment they get there to the moment they leave to control every possible thing. Um, and you just can't do that with internet. So do you think it's only internet that's a failure or do you think it's something else? I mean, when we think about the ecosystem from a technological perspective, at this point in time, the Marriott is part of it, maybe it's not. And I think one of the interesting things that you alluded to, but didn't necessarily explore, um, we'll pick on DC for a little bit, right? The Hilton there in um, Georgetown or kind of the uptown area is gorgeous. But the last time they updated the Wi-Fi infrastructure was the early 2000s. Moscone, I mean, when we were there for PCMA last year, we were all spent most of the time walking around going, wow, the internet is working again in all of the buildings, not just the main ballroom. Do you think the infrastructure at the convention centers and a lot of these tier two cities, which are really seeing a stronger return to events than some of the really big um, you know, venues that maybe have invested in that technology infrastructure? Is that a risk we should be asking about? And if so, how do we ask about it? 
Yeah, and, and I, I'm certainly happy to wax poetic on any of these topics. I was trying to be concise because I thought it was a lightning round. So yeah, I, believe me, I, I can go on about on and on about all these things. <laughs> so I tried to get... I tried to give a short answer on that one. Um, what's what's been fascinating to me is is much like the production companies, right? Where a lot of them, unfortunately, sat on their hands, tried to just weather the storm. Same thing with venues, right? So a lot of them just like, you know, we're just going to try and get through this thing. And then others were like proactively trying to find ways that they can be interesting, trying to find you know, you know, opening themselves up as uh, my video disappeared. Where did you I think you go? turned off my video. I didn't turn off your video. You turned off your it, video. It says the host has disabled. Oh, I disabled you? All right. So let's bring it back in. See, talking about- She doesn't like me anymore. Things we can't control. Keep talking and we're going to bring it's you all right. back. So I'll, I'll keep uh, talking about it. So just like we saw with the production companies, the venues did the same thing. So a lot of venues, there we go. Um, uh, the venues- um, some of them started looking for additional ways to raise revenue, right? So how do we, can we rent ourselves out as a studio? Um, can we partner with an AV company to bring in? I'm hearing some great success stories about that, of, of venues that have, you know, partnered with AV companies with like leasing brand new equipment and renting themselves out as, as uh, studio spaces. Um, and a lot of companies said, okay, great. There's nobody in our ballrooms. It's time to renovate the ballroom. It's time to rip out the, the, the existing terrible infrastructure and fix it and make it go. And so it doesn't hurt to say when was the last time you upgraded your internet uh, routers and things like that. When was the last time the ballroom was renovated? Because again, some companies, some venues did and some venues didn't. So one of the questions that came in then is they say, okay, we updated it, but I hear a lot about the up and the down speed. Is there like a minimum, what is it, MBPS or something I should be tracking for? It's, yeah. <laughs> um, so the, the good news is it doesn't have to be very high, but the bad news is it's all about getting a dedicated line. And so that's why we always say we want that hard line internet at the venue. Right, so not you're not on the Wi-Fi, you're not um, you know on a sh any kind of shared network with anybody else. If you can get that, if you can get guaranteed speeds, you don't actually need more than you know five to ten megabits per second upload speed. Now, to be safe, you want to be in at least the twenty-five range and up. Having more speed doesn't hurt. <laughs> you know, but it's you know you really can get as long as it's a solid connection with nobody else on it, you can get away with five to 10 megabits per second because you're only sending one outgoing feed. It's not like it's having to bring back in all of the you know people that are watching. Um, so things to be careful of, 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 all right, we wanna get a hardline internet connection. We wanna make sure it's not shared uh, with anybody. That's, that's dedicated speed that we're getting out of it because a lot of times what'll happen with again, older infrastructures is they've got the Wi-Fi network and then they've got like the hardline network. And then at some point they come together into the same box. Um, and so all of it's then going out to the internet at the same, you know, the, you know, through the same switch. And if that switch fails, everything goes down. Um, or that switch might be limited on how much capacity it has to handle the 4,000 people that are on Wi-Fi and your two, you know, hardline internet connections um, you know, could be a problem. So it doesn't hurt to do a little digging around just to find out, you know, am I, am I getting dedicated speed is what we want to be looking for. And a follow-up question for that is, okay, so I had to postpone my event. I have already signed my contract and now I have all of these outrageous internet needs that you have just described for us. How do I go back? Because typically I negotiate my Wi-Fi concessions and all of that jazz back then, and I've already had to give away the baby in the bathwater just to get back and do this thing, you know, after the force majeure. Humbly and kindly. <laughs> it's, you know, I mean, it's the old saying, right? You know, before you sign the contract, it's negotiation after it's begging. And so, you know, if you're working on a contract, you know, that's just been pushed through from a previous year, um, it's uh we were talking a little bit about this i think in the pre-show is is that you know you might need to be able to be open to walk away i mean you know this is stuff you need now and if your venue is going to stick you on it um you know you might need to see if you've got other options 
And, um, you know, if it's one of, you know, if you've got a good working relationship with them and they've allowed you to postpone without any fees or anything like that, you want to keep that good relationship going, right? And you want to make sure that you're not going to get dinged, obviously, by canceling and moving on. But at the same time, you know, keep your options open, you know, find out what, how much would it hurt you? How much would it ding you uh, to cancel? Um, and how much, you know, you compare that to how much you might save uh, moving. It's, there's never a rhyme or reason to that stuff. I mean, you, you think about things like third party AV fees versus in-house, you know, companies. So, so sometimes the in-house fees are so high that even if you pay the penalties to bring in a third party company, it's still going to be less expensive. <laughs> so it never hurts to, uh, you know, to, to, to keep your options open and to know what those options are. Because even if you want to use the in-house AV company, you can still use that for leverage. And same, same here, right? You know, hey, I want to use you guys. We, we wanted to come last year. We want to come back this year. But I, I can do it for half the price at this other location. You know, I mean, can you work with me here? Can you meet me halfway? And unfortunately, and this is one of the things that I'm worried about as we're reincorporating our in-person as we're coming back, human beings have a very natural tendency that anytime they feel a loss, there's a natural tendency to try and recoup that loss, to get it back. And so not even consciously, we're seeing AV costs coming up. We're seeing venue costs coming up. We're seeing in internet costs coming up. We're seeing new fees and charges that didn't exist a year ago suddenly magically appearing. And I don't think it's a price gouging necessarily, but I think it is a natural human being response. And so I'm kind of just, hey folks, just take it easy out there. Be nice to each other out there. And remember that the whole industry took a hit and let's not try and make it all up in one year uh, by by charging each other ridiculous prices. I mean, you bring up an interesting point there because I think there's two sides of the coin, right? I, on one hand, you know, I just got back from smart meetings this weekend for one of the events and a lot of the venues were talking about how it's a buyer's market. Essentially, the event planners can come in and we hold more of the cards than we did before the pandemic in many ways, just because our budgets are limited and where are they gonna go? On the other hand, Liz Lathan, from Hot Doc Amazo, there was like a whole LinkedIn conversation happening just about that price raise conversation because there are more additional, I think, infrastructure costs and some other things that some of the venues and the AV companies have been taking on. And so one of the things that I know you always advocate for, and there's a checklist hiding somewhere, and I think all your your goodie bags, is the like, what's the stuff and have the AV team or the venue itemized, right? You know, if you think you're being price gouged, really ask, what is that and why is that there? And is this always going to be there and figure out different ways to talk through it? Because it's not even a, a recouping conversation, but it's a understanding and education moment for many of us as we try to figure out, just like we did after the shootings and everything like that. Do we really need the security guard against the domestic terrorism threat? Well, I don't know. What's it worth to you from a life perspective around that? All right, one and more question. Just when you think you've got it figured out, by the way, you know, one of my other in-person clients lost their venue. So like while they were, you know, they, they were renegotiating and they were like, oh yeah, well, we're going to push it and it's going to be, it was going to be in June, but now it's in August. And and then they're like, okay, we'd like to go with it. Like, oh yeah, we sold it two days ago. So it may be a buyer's market in some aspects, but depending on, you know, I think a lot of people are starting to zero in on that fall you know, August, September time period. So it might not be as buyer market as some of us might like. That's true. It was interesting. Again, smart meetings, the Broadmoor was like, yeah, we don't really have capacity until like the end of 2022. And you're like, oh, really? That's insane. And then going over in Cedar Rapids, bless you, was like, no, we can totally take you. You know, it's just a lot of opportunities within that. Um, all right. So can you give us an example of something you've seen over the last 12 to 18 months where you saw the highest ROI from an attendee participant perspective when using technology? So, so I'm gonna try and go the opposite direction and, and hopefully that'll push us in the right direction because where we didn't see ROI, where people came back and were like, well, that was a waste of my time and that was a waste of my money. We're almost, we're almost always instances where the planners just charged ahead and did not do what we talked about an hour ago um, of working with their stakeholders. 
They just found a platform and did it. And they took their online agenda or they took their in-person agenda and they pushed it online and they said, great, we checked off all the boxes, let's go. And then surprise, surprise, their stakeholders were not happy with the experience. And that's where a lot of this drive to come back to in-person. See, we did it online and it sucked. Um, you know, without trying to find out what was missing, what didn't work, what didn't you get out of it? And so when we see ROI, when we're getting ROI, it's because we went to our stakeholders and said, what do you need to get out of this? Is it the education? Is it the networking? Is it the serendipity of meeting someone in the hall that you haven't seen in six months? And then trying to find a way to not replicate the experience, but replicate the effect, replicate the value of what it is. Um, so, so hopefully by showing the negative, I can prove the positive that, that where people have been happy, where people have said that was the best online event that I've been to yet is when they were engaged, when they were down with the content, when they were when they were, were made to feel comfortable, when they were made to get where they got what they wanted to get out of it. And for some groups, that's networking. For other groups, it's leads and not just a giant pile of leads, but hot leads. And so for a lot of our exhibitors, the ones that were saying, I don't get what I normally get out of online, out of in-person events, it usually boils down to that they would use the time in the booth to figure out, is this a hot lead or a cold lead? You know, and we see those people that are, there's, there's two different types of exhibitors, right? There's the kind that's like, would you like to enter a contest? Can I scan your badge? Beep. Would you like to enter a contest? Can I scan your badge? Beep. And then there are those that are schmoozing, they're talking, they're having contests, they're having a party in their booth, and they're using that time to try and zone in on hot leads. So when you want ROI for any of your stakeholders, your attendees, your internal stakeholders, your, your sponsors and your exhibitors. It's about finding what, what is value to them. What is value to them out of the experience? And that could be things as simple as zoning in on uh, exhibitors that are all using the same CRM, right? So that they're able to take your data and just import it straight into their sales and marketing funnels. That saves them an enormous amount of time from fiddling around with a, you know, an Excel spreadsheet that they get after the event. That's value. And so looking for those ways to provide value to them is very much dependent on the stakeholders themselves and what they, what they get out of the event. So that brings up an interesting question that Norella just dropped in the chat that I think has been one, you know, I know when we were at Untethered, they were talking a lot about this, but I'm not sure, I don't think the industry is there yet. So, so prove me wrong, right? What's your experience at live events, virtual, hybrid, or otherwise, for the holograms, the VR, the XR. And how does the audience receive this from an experience perspective? And then really get nitty gritty and talk to me about pricing. Cause I know they've been having a lot of shifts there. Um, I, don't, I don't think we know how these audiences are going to react, right? So as we come out of this, um, things have changed. We have changed as individuals, as, as attendees, um, as suppliers, as vendors, we've changed. And so what we have gotten used to over the course of this last year is that anybody can come in from anywhere. And so thinking again to what is value, is it more valuable to have someone who wouldn't be able to come there in person come via hologram than it would be to not have them come at all. So that's really what we're talking about here, right? Is, is weighing the value proposition, weighing the person that I can get to come, you know, take three days out of the office and join me at my event because it's a day to travel. And then you want to be comfortable and get there in the morning, be there in the morning and then run their, you know, run their event. And maybe they leave that night or maybe they get to stay for the after party and leave the next day. Or the person who's like the top of their game, the best heart surgeon in the world to come in and talk to my group via either a live stream or a hologram. So I'll push back a little bit in that it doesn't even have to be hologram, right? It can just be a live stream. If it's the top person in the world, I want to see that even if I'm there in person and they're not. Um, so there may be a value to that. And how do you find out? You ask your attendees. <laughs> Right? It keeps coming back around to that. You know, it's, it's such, it's, I know it's, you know, such a simple thing, but you know, is it more valuable, you know, ask your attendees, is it more valuable to have a higher caliber of presenter 
that's brought in either on a screen or by, via hologram than it is to have the person there in person. And I think you'll be interested to see what, because it depends on the audience. Some are going to say, oh, no, I want the top person. Others are going to say, yeah, I think it's me. Fine. So, you know, to get into you, so that's all of those things. Holograms, VR, again, don't just throw tech at it to make, you know, oh, it's going to make my event better if I have a hologram. You know, have a reason for it. You know, very few events need a hologram, but it can be a cool effect if that's the right thing for your event to have cool effects. You know, for a lot of like Silicon Valley type places, that's part of the gig It's having cool effects and cool special effects and things. So, or uh, brands like, you know, or, you know, a lot of the top, you know, marketing brands are going to want to have that thing. But for the average thing, it's not going to affect much. Now, when we get into, you know, XR, you mentioned XR, it's not in the question specifically, but you know, XR is when we're talking about having like virtual background, you know, like fully virtual sets and things like that, extended reality. I'm in front of a green screen, but we've got this huge virtual set behind me. Um, that's cool if you're beaming those people in, right? It's the same thing. It's like, if we're going to beam people in, we might as well make it look cool. And so that becomes an option. And then even just like I was talking about before, venues having these studio spaces. So again, does it make sense to have the top person of the game or this celebrity versus that celebrity in an enclosed, comfortable, nice studio with four cameras and good audio? Um, if, if you know, we're going to be in a room of 5,000 people and we're just going to see them on side screens anyway. You know, so we have to factor those things in as well. If you're in a room of over a few hundred people, chances are you're just watching the iMag anyway. So unless you're actually having that VIP meet and greet, it starts to become, you know, and then you might be able to save some money too, because they're, they're not having to take three days out of the office and have airfare and all that kind of stuff. They're just going around the corner to the local studio. So the budget question there is probably, it depends. Like if you're a it, 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 Yeah, company, you see how I skillfully avoided answering that part of it. <laughs> Experience, right? You're like, it right. could be a hundred thousand, right. but for some of the instances there, you're like, it's the studio fee, which is like maybe five to 10 K plus the editing time and all of those different pieces. So it ranges in many different variations. Like all of this stuff, right? Because it ranges from zero to, you know, you know, I, I can put on a virtual background in zoom. Um, you know, it's not great, but you know, it could be better than the dirt pile of dirty laundry or something that would be behind me to hundreds of thousands of dollars to be potentially in a full XR studio with motion capture cameras and, you know, things are moving around and sliding and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so it's always difficult on budget questions because most of the time the answer is literally zero to hundreds of thousands of dollars. <laughs> so, so, um, but it's always getting better, right? It's always getting better. It's always getting cheaper. So don't rule it out. So for example, I'm very anti virtual background, you know, um, you know, if you're looking at me now, this is what my office looks like. Um, but it's not what my office looks like now, because this is a green screen. And it's what my office looked like three months ago, my office has actually a different color now. But the, you know, you can do tricks of like you you take that image, you take the picture with the camera, that's the same lens and the same, you know, lights as the camera that it would be. And then you put that behind you, it's going to look more realistic than if I have something that's not that. But the fact of the matter is, you know, if you know, I can go in and I can change that um, to something different. Let's see. So most people don't know that I have a green screen in a virtual background and I'm out a total of 200 bucks to make that happen. <laughs> you know, the actual hardware to make a better green screen than the built-in green screen that's in Zoom. So, you know, it gets a little more complicated than that because you've got lights and, and, and the screen itself and all that kind of, but it's a $12 green screen and the lights I got for 99 bucks. So it doesn't have to be thousands of dollars and you can slowly upgrade the experience. But I love the idea of bringing our presenters into these, these new studio spaces in venues. You know, one of the ones that I was talking to a guy is like literally right next to the biggest train station in France, in Paris. So like people can easily come in from the suburbs, do a full day shoot and then go back out and they don't have to fly all over the world. So I love those types of ideas of remote presenters, in-person audiences. There's well, a lot of possibilities there. Pull that over a little bit because having, you know, we're still kind of in transition. And like you mentioned at the very beginning of this, it's gonna be a long tail, right? So the concerns around privacy and security policies and making it all work because there was always that issue for security before. And now it's like the Zoom bombers aren't necessarily the biggest issue out there. It's kind of like someone could hack the event and bring it all down and talk about really being locked out of the show. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the security thing isn't as big of an issue as 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 most. As long as you're just being safe, like most of the Zoom bombing was happening because people were sharing their links publicly. <laughs> you know, so as long as you're not doing that, um, it's you know, there, to this day though, there are still companies that are like, yeah, I want to be able, but I, I can't use Zoom because of the security issues. There were no security issues. It was that people were literally posting their Zoom links online publicly. It's like putting a giant sign outside the convention center that says, come in free food. You know, it's, uh, you know, one of those things. So um, it's, you know, to my knowledge, there was never any instances of actually hacking into a, a Zoom account. Now, be aware, and this is another full hours webinar, uh, as you know, um, when we start talking cybersecurity, that you got to be using, and I hate to bring it up, the password manager, um, because if you if you are using the same, I know, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> If you're using the same password everywhere, and that includes your Zoom account, once one account gets hacked, the first thing they do when they get a new batch of passwords and emails is to try against all the banks, Google, you know, Google, Apple, Microsoft, right? All, they're like the stock 10 things. I guarantee you Zoom is now in that top 10 of things they're going to try uh, if, you know, once they get a hold of a username and password. So it's just another reason that we have to have good password hygiene, not be reusing the same passwords all over the place, because they're going to start trying Zoom, Teams, Meet, all of those things. I guess Teams and Meet would already be included in, in, micro, in Microsoft and Google, but still. So sorry, I had to bring it up. Like a last pass or something like that, right? Which I, I was this year's old when I discovered that last pass meant the last password you will ever need. And we're still trying to recover my actual MFA. But all right. So, I, so fine. oh, go ahead. I took that very much to heart and I forced myself to memorize a randomized 16 digit code because it was the last password I would ever have to memorize. And I still have so. an ongoing training where we're eventually going to get there. All right. So the very, very last question yeah. is, Will we ever find an all-in-one event tech solution? Yes, it's whatever one you're using, um, and and I mean that not in a snarky way, but it's you know I, I this 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 metaphor of the digital venue continues to work a year later. That's what we were all you know that's what we were calling our online platforms that that's your digital venue, and this metaphor continues to work a year later because. Again, you can have a great event, a fully complete, happy event in a field, um, and you can have it in the ballroom of a Ritz and, and everything in between. And all you're doing is fine tuning, you know, what your attendees want, what your attendees, you know, what is, brings value to them. You know, does it, you know, is it more, is it more important to have a good golf course nearby or a good spa? Is it more important to have a gym? You know, is it more important to have great breakout rooms because of all the sessions that we're going to have? So any digital venue can be the venue, can be the complete solution. But we're always, there's, you know, I, I, keep, I always say there's no such thing as a perfect show. You know, I had a, an old producer that was always like, was that it? Was that, I think that was a perfect show. I was like, there's no such thing as a perfect show. We're always trying to make it better. We're always trying to make it a little bit better. So fine tuning which features we use, which features we don't use, which features were confusing, <laughs> which features were amazing, you know? And so, yes, we can have all in one. You can do a fantastic event on just Zoom. Or you can do a fantastic event on a you know, full platform like Entrado, on 24, Meeting Play, you know, all these guys. Um, and, and, and everyone in between, all of the 200 people that pivoted in between, you know, all of those can be great. And it can be free. It can be $15,000 for an online platform. There's great ones that are 10 to 25. Or it can be $300,000, which a lot of them were, especially last year. So... So it's, it might be a cop-out, but that's, that's my answer, is that you can do a great event on any platform, you can do a great event on any uh, medium, um, but it's all about the planning and it's not about the technology. And I know that's hard for a technology guy to say, it's not about the technology, it's about how you use it and the planning behind it. I love it. Well, Brant, as always, you have shared so much knowledge. So thank you for giving us almost a full hour and a half of your time. This is fantastic. Where can people find you, tweet you, high five you, see you at your next event? It's real simple. It's brantkruger.com is the website. 
uh, B R A N D T K R U E G E R uh, dot com. And uh, yeah, I'm at Brant Kruger, Brant Kruger on Twitter. And um, somebody sniped the LinkedIn thing and then hasn't updated it in like eight years. So it's like B R Kruger on LinkedIn, but you just search for me. And I'm the one that's not a cop in San Jose. All right. And then when's your next person? I'm kidding. It's like a software season? developer or somebody. What was that? <laughs> like, what? That's so random. Here's your party cocktail conversation. Are you coming to MPI this summer? Are we going to see you at IMAX this fall? When are you going to be in person? I don't know yet. I don't know yet when the, when the next in-person uh, industry event is going to be. I'm not on the slate for WEC uh, this go around. Um, I had some other things on the plate that I had to, had to take care of. Um, and, uh, so I don't know. Yeah. I don't know when we're going to be seeing, but like I said, I've saved up an awful lot of hugs. So be ready. All right. Well, guys, thank you so much for joining us to our entire audience who joined on demand in person, who participated, who lurked and who were just contributing to so much of this together. You were fantastic. A great audience as always. We love having you. We are doing this every month bringing you all the knowledge around marketing, creative events and strategy. We want to have better event design, better marketing design, better campaigns, right? Because our participants and our audience are at the center of everything we do. So please share us, like us, find us online, tell us what you're thinking at Nifty Method. Check us out for the services at www.niftymethod.com and drop us a line and tell us who you want to see speak at our next webinar and join us with the Knowledge Bombs. We'll be re uh, reaching out to you with your CEU. If you are already part of the EIC's database, we're going to be uploading it there as well as ASAEs so that you can get your credit. And uh, we will see you next time go around. I hear little birdies telling me that Lisa Carell from Proxfinity are coming as well as Mike um, Dominguez is coming for an industry health check in the next couple months. So we've got some good stuff. We've got some awesome stuff. And you, my friends, are awesome at what you do. Thank you for being part of our industry, sticking with it and continuing to plan, produce, and just make every event amazing. We will see you next time. Thanks, Carla. Thanks, Heather. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Senna. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Kami. Thanks, uh, Dawn. Thanks, Maria. Thanks, Marnie. Thanks, Roseanne. Thanks, Norella. Thanks, Maria. <laughs> I think we're still live, so I'll just keep saying thanks to everybody. Who else is still here? Thanks, Christina. Thanks, Shauna. Thanks, Diane. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thanks, France. Thanks, Laura. Levi. Hi, Levi. There you are. Meredith. Michael. I already said. Norella. I said. Serena. Stacy. Susan. Thanks, everybody. All right, now I'm going to buy. Bye-bye.